I am thrilled to welcome back two of my favorite folks, um, both in person, Ron in the past, and now Jeff, I get to see him for the first time. Um, they each, this is now their third appearance for FAN. We first hosted Ron in 2015 at North Shore Country Day in Winnetka, and then we welcomed him back in 2021 for a Zoom event. Uh, this is Jeff's first in-person event after two Zoom events in 2020 and 21, so it's so nice to see him in 3D. Um, very nice. It's um, great to have them together. I'm sure you can probably appreciate that they're topics are complementary and of interest, uh, and we love that they can talk about finding that right fit at the right price. Now, Ron has been, as many of you know, the Your Money columnist for the New York Times since 2008. His most recent best-selling book, For Sale in That Lobby, is The Price You Pay for College, an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. We also love his 2015 bestseller, that was the first time we hosted him, The Opposite of Spoiled, Raising Kids Who Are Grounded, Generous, and Smart About Money. That book is also in the hallway. He is a three-time winner of the Gerald Loeb Award, Business Journalism's Highest Honor. He has written about higher, oh, excuse me, sorry. That's the two paragraphs about you. I started going into the third paragraph, but now I'm talking about Jeff. Jeff Salingo has written about higher education for more than two decades and is a New York Times bestselling author of three books. His latest book, Who Gets In and Why, A Year Inside College Admissions, was named among the 100 notable books of the year by the New York Times. He's a regular contributor to The Atlantic and a special advisor for innovation and professor of practice at Arizona State University. He also writes an excellent bi-weekly newsletter on all things higher ed called Next. I get it in my inbox, I read it, even though my son's almost ready to graduate from college, and co-hosts the podcast Future You. Joining Ron and Jeff on stage is Andrea Mondragon, the Joan Feitler 49, class of 49, co-director of college counseling at Francis Parker. Andrea and her fellow co-director, Becca Te oh, you know, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Tebby. Excellent. Becca Tebby are talented, experienced college counselors, and they have collaborated on a wide range of questions for tonight's event. So now let's all settle in and listen and learn. Let's welcome them all. Hello, hello, everybody. And of course, thank you to Dr. Frank and to Lonnie. And of course, thank you to Ron and Jeff for being here tonight. I know you've traveled long and far, sort of, right? <laughs> so I'm happy that you're here. Ron. Welcome home. It must be so, so, so exciting to be here. Of course, we're delighted to have you. And of course, you know, Jeff, a very warm Parker welcome. Um, I am absolutely delighted and honored to have this conversation. What a great opportunity. You both have, as we've heard, a tremendous amount of experience um, to offer into what is a very complex admissions process. I see some fellow Parker former parents and upcoming parents in the room, and so I'm really looking forward to tonight. Um, certainly, it's, it's you know, my role, I think, to just keep the conversation going. So I'll pose some questions that I think many of you might be thinking about, certainly lots of questions that we get in our office. Because there's so much to cover, I am, if it's okay, gonna organize the conversation around some themes. So we're gonna go with, you know, talking about the admissions landscape post-COVID. We'll talk about, you know, the business of, of admissions and then talk about equity and identity. It's obviously a hot topic at this point in time. And then we'll, you know, of course, touch on and talk quite a bit about the cost and value of college both throughout and then again at the very end. All the themes overlap as, as Lonnie mentioned, but that's, that's the plan if, if that feels good. We've certainly got a lot to cover, but I think it might be helpful to our audience um, to just get a sense and a glimpse into each of your books. So if, let's go ahead and start there. Um, I'm not sure if you want to start, or Jeff, if you would prefer to, but let's start there. If that's As okay. the alum, let's uh, run. Perfect, I'm, let's I'm, do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to insist that Jeff begin. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to start uh, just by saying um, thank you. Uh, it is really great to be home. and. Uh, um, and I want to thank uh, Dan and everybody at Parker who made this ho uh, possible, and also, of course, uh, Lonnie and Fan. If you have not been to a Fan event before, uh, you should sign up immediately and come to all of the other ones that they offer from here to eternity. Um, Jeff and I both do a, a lot of speaking on various topics in front of parent groups, and inevitably, uh, Lonnie is um, the most organized and the consummate host. Uh, so 
really you all should just um, show up for anything that she programs. Um, <laughs> so thanks for having us. And I've been wanting to share a, a stage with Jeff Salingo for years now, so I'm going to shut up and say as little as possible. <laughs> uh, well, plus one on all the thanks uh, for being here uh, tonight, and really appreciate you uh, uh, for those uh, joining us online and as well as uh, those uh, in the audience. So the book, uh, Who Gets In and Why, A Year Inside College Admissions, really kind of started a couple of years ago when I was reading uh, another New York Times author, uh, Jack Steinberg, who wrote uh, The Gatekeepers. And he embedded himself in Wesleyan, uh, Wesleyan in 1998, 99 around uh, for a series that was in the New York Times that eventually became a book. And as I was reading that book, I realized just how much, and this is now 2015, 2016, when I was rereading this, I realized just how much college admissions had changed. Uh, and from even just that period 15 years earlier. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was kind of get inside the process and not just what Jack did, where he was at one university and following a group of students applying to that university, but in, in um, covering higher education for you know, 20 years as I had at the Chronicle of Higher Education, I realized that there was all this stuff that was happening around the college admissions process in that it is a business that I wanted to make sure to focus on in the books. And so the book really takes us through a year inside college admissions, but not just from the perspective of inside the admissions office, but also a cast of characters outside. Uh, so that includes the people who do marketing. So if you're in the college admissions process, you know you get overwhelmed now with email and, and snail mail. And how does that all happen? How does that all come about? Um, so that's a cast of characters, the rankers, the, the testing agencies is one group of characters. Basically, these people that you may never meet, you may never see, but actually have a lot of influence in the admissions process. The second group are students themselves. So I followed a group of about 30 uh, seniors that year in 2018, 2019. Three of them are profiled in the book. And then, of course, the institutions. Uh, so I was embedded in Emory University, uh, Davidson College, and the University of Washington. I'm always asked, how did you pick those three? Um, I approached 24, um, and just like you apply to college, uh, three of them said yes, and 21 said no. Uh, and we could talk about why, the reasons why, but, uh, but it was really, I'm really happy that three said yes, and in many ways you might say, well, I'm not applying to any of those three universities, but you, know, you have one you know, elite private university, one small liberal arts college, and one big public university. In many ways, they, are, they represent that kind of that sector. Um, and so if you're applying to a big public, or you're applying to a big you know, selective private, or you're applying to a liberal arts college, it kind of meets the criteria for that. Absolutely. Thank you. So I came to personal finance by accident. Um, it happened in part because of my uh, early adulthood obsession with frequent flyer miles. And so I you know, didn't grow up writing about the bond market for the Wall Street Journal or anything like that. Um, but the way I eventually found my way to it was that um, you know, I definitely didn't know more about finance um, than a lot of the other journalists who I've worked with along the way. Um, but I did know a lot about persons, personal, right? Because it turns out that um, money and emotions and the sort of sometimes toxic mixture between the two um, were things that I sort of understood intuitively or just made it my um, purpose to sort of figure out. And so I tend to specialize uh, in my work, uh, in my day job at the New York Times, at um, stuff where there's like kind of a Venn diagram of things that are super expensive. Um, the product or the service um, is extremely complicated and often opaque. And then there's like a whole bunch of feelings involved that you know, mess up the two other things. Right? So like college is, is really the sort of perfect you know, middle of those three um, circles. And so I, you know, it was only natural that I gravitated to it uh, in my work, first at the Wall Street Journal and then at the New York Times. So you know, when I first became a parent like 17 years ago, I started writing a lot about 
how to save for college. And back then, 529 college savings plans were relatively new and relatively bad. Um, and I and other people did a lot of work over the years just sort of pointing out how expensive they were and how bad the investment choices are. A lot of that's been fixed, which is great. So um, 10 or 12 years ago, I started writing more about how to pay for college or how not to pay for college, as the case may be, because 2008, 2009, 2010, that's when a bunch of people started washing out of private universities with a bachelor's degree at the age of 22, but also $100,000 in some instances in undergraduate student loan debt for which there had been no grown-up co-signer, right? A bunch of adults had told 17-year-olds, in many cases when they got into college, that they should just go borrow this money. Um, and uh, to this day, uh, you know, I continue to write about um, the ramifications of our, you know, essentially broken student loan system in the country. Um, but uh, I'd say, you know, round about six or seven years ago, as many of you, especially the early breeders in our cohort, um, <laughs> you know, started to get to the point where your 16 or 17 year olds were approaching the process, and my readers did too, and I think they just sort of smelled this on me. People started to come at me with these questions, and, you know, they would usually go something like this, right? I live in, you know, the suburbs of Chicago, say. And my kid um, is into the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And that is going to cost, well, I mean, the state is such a fiscal basket case now, right? But, you know, that's going to cost, uh, you know, $140,000 all in for four years with no financial aid. I think that's about the rack right now. Um, and then my kid, you know, wa maybe wants to be an English major, also got into Kenyon College in Ohio. And Kenyon College gave us this discount called Merit Aid. We'd never heard of that. This you know, sort of discount shows up. We can afford to pay, um, but we can't afford to pay so much that we don't have to at least stop and think about it, right? So Kenyon, list price 75,000, discounting to $50,000 per year with this so-called Merit Aid, right? So Champaign-Urbana 140, Kenyon 200. Then the kid went and shot the lights out and got into Vanderbilt. But again, we don't, Earn, you know, we earn just enough so that we don't qualify for any need-based aid. Vanderbilt today, probably $350,000 if your kid starts next year and goes for four years. So, you know, these parents would say to me, like, your newspaper can't shut up about the fact that we live in a world awash in big data. So can you just point me to the big data set that explains why Vanderbilt is $150,000 better than Kenyon and you know, $200,000 better than the University of Illinois? Uh, and that data set does not exist. And when I started trying to figure out why, I realized that it was probably because the schools kind of like it that way. Right? Because in the absence of data, people make financial decisions, big ones, on the basis of feelings, big feelings. Right? And so what I realized was that um, for all the ink I had spilled about how to, pay for, uh, how to pay for college or how to save for college, I'd missed the most important question of all, which is what to pay for college. Right? So that's a question um, about value. But it's also a question about values, right? What does your family stand for, right? What is the definition of success here with this college stuff? How much is enough, right? And what are you really shopping for in the first place? What is college, right? So I didn't mean to get all existential about it, but you sort of got to know what it is that you're looking for before you start throwing $500,000 in pre-tax income at it. So that's sort of where it started, um, and it ended, you know, seven years later with the book. Wow. You all can see how these topics are very, very intertwined. Mm -hmm. So fantastic overviews. I think what, where we should go here then is you both highlighted that things have changed a lot, right, from even two years ago. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, from each of your lenses, can you tell us more about what those major changes and trends have been, how they've unfolded? Um, not just due to the pandemic, but even, Jeff, as you noted, from when The Gatekeepers was, was written. Yeah. So I think the, the big thing is that people always ask me, well, you know, if I, if, if I ask you, is it harder to get into college today than when you, went all, you all went, I bet you most hands would go up. And the fact of the matter is, is that the average acceptance rate at an American college or university is <clears throat> 65%. So most colleges accept most students who apply. 
but we tend to talk about the small group of mm -hmm. colleges and universities, more so today than we did, I think, 20, 25 years ago. Right. A little bit of that is to blame on Ron's employer, the New York <laughs> Times, right, which writes about Harvard and Harvard all the time. Uh, the US News and World Report rankings, right, which started in 1989. In the summer of 1994, I was a summer intern at the US News and World Report rankings. But for the most part, like in, uh, you know, in the early 1990s, they were still kind of just starting to take off. But they've really kind of entered our lexicon as a, as a source of like, well, where do these schools uh, rank? The Common App, uh, and the growth of the Common App, more than 900 colleges now, on the, or now more than 1,000 colleges on the Common App, and now as easy as pressing a button to apply uh, to multiple colleges. Um, and our concept of distance has also changed. Um, I think we tend to forget about this. My, my sister, uh, who's the oldest in our family, went to college in, in 1983, and I'll never forget like, having to call her like, late at night. Um, or she would call us late at night on the payphone in the hallway of her dorm you know, after 10 o'clock when long distance rates were, were down. Well now, so going to college from Pennsylvania to California at that time was like going halfway around the world. Well now it isn't, right? right? With the birth of of, you know, of the internet, obviously, of cell phones and of mobile devices now where you could FaceTime your kids. So all of this has changed just up till the point of COVID in 2018, right? So we, we really started to think differently about the landscape of higher education. And so what ended up happening was that more students started to apply to the same set of colleges. The kids from Chicago and New York and Miami and then add the international students. And so you started to see over time these applicant pools just grow tremendously. I, I remember when I was at, at Emory, right? It took, it took decades for Emory to go from 10,000 applicants to 20,000 applicants and then just took a couple of years to go from 20,000 applicants to 30,000 applicants. And I'm looking at Tim Fields who is in the audience tonight from, from, uh, from Emory and how many are you in now? Yeah, 33,000, right? So just the numbers have gone up. Meanwhile, by the way, all of these places have the freshman classes remain the same. And so that's why we've seen then these plummeting acceptance rates and then people wanted to get, get in even more. Then COVID hit. And I think the two big changes in COVID were that the numbers increased even more, yeah. right? Because students couldn't go to visit these colleges. And so there was this concern like, well, I can't go visit, so I'm just going to apply. I'm gonna hedge my bets and apply. But then the big thing was test optional, yeah. right? So test, test optional existed before COVID. There were, about, um, there were about 1,000 colleges that were test optional before COVID, but most of them were less selective, except for uh, the University of Chicago, a bunch of uh, uh, selective uh, liberal arts colleges, and, and Wake Forest were kind of the more, most of the, the known uh, test optional colleges. But then in the midst of COVID, 600 more colleges and universities, including the entire Ivy League, all these really selective colleges went test optional. And what happened then was people said, ah, Harvard, I might as well apply. Why not? Right? Why not? <laughs> and so then again, the number of applicants increased even more. And I think what's happening now is that this is still taking a couple of years to shake out is like, what is the applicant pool at these very highly selective colleges going to look like? And when the acceptance rates now are like one, two, three percent, to a point now, many of these colleges aren't even telling you what their acceptance rates are. Uh, so what then happens, right? So then students start to look at a, a selection of other schools and other colleges and universities. And that's what I think is really happening right now. And I think that you're, you're starting to see the lens that we look at of colleges and universities expand a little bit. And we're starting to say, well, nah, we're not going to look at these 10 schools because they're impossible to get into. Maybe we'll now start looking at these 10 and these 20 and these 30. And I think we're in this period right now of, of great ambiguity about where all that's going to shake out. And it, largely, I blame a big piece of that on what happened during COVID, particularly with test optional. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and I think that you are spot on as, as we talk about test optional admissions. Here at Parker, at least, I mean, that's probably the most common question that Beck and I get is around test optional. Do I send my scores? Do I not? So my next question, just as a follow up and really for both of you is, you know, let's talk more about test optional. Is it here to stay? Do you think? I mean, is it? And what role does it play, Ron, in particularly the awarding of, of, of merit money or discounting? Because I, I think it's a really valid question as families are preparing 
for you know, the next couple years? What, what's the landscape going to look like on the testing front? Um, well, I'll be very quick on this. I, I just finished a piece uh, that appeared in New York Magazine a couple of weeks ago on, on test optional or on testing in general. And, and it was really centered around MIT, which had made a big decision uh, last March to go back to testing. And the question is, are they going to be the outlier or are they going to be the bellwether and everyone's going to follow them? And my, my feeling after reporting this piece and, and talking to admissions deans at a number of colleges, I think it's going to be really hard for a lot of these institutions to go back to requiring testing. Most institutions that have gone test optional, especially over the last couple of years, for the most part, they like it. It gives them, a, first of all, they're getting a ton of applicants, right? They're more quote unquote popular than ever before. But more than that, it gives them ultimate flexibility in crafting the class that they want to craft mm. without having to worry about that specter of a, of a test score sitting out there. Right. So I think it's going to be really hard for a lot of these universities to go back to requiring testing. So I think, you know, two or three years from now, I still think that MIT, it's not that no one will go back, but I still think that MIT will be the outlier for the most part. And Jeff, just to put a finer point on it, the reason why it is convenient um, for a school to be test optional, is it that the only scores they get now have a 15 in front of them, and so that helps their US News ranking because anything below that just doesn't get sent in to the 25 or 50 most selective yeah, schools? Yeah, I think that that's part of it, and yeah. when you required a test score, and you had applicants that you really liked for various reasons, but then there was a test score that didn't quite make it there in terms of a number. Maybe it had a, a nine or a 10 or 11, 12, whatever that score might have been. It was really hard for some of these institutions to get over that. So they might have liked everything else about the applicant, but then there's this test score that, especially if you're going to admit a lot of students with that test score would bring down your average. Now, you know, you could take these students at the very end and it wouldn't affect your average. But now, if those students are not sending those test scores that are considered low by a, a particular university standards, they now have a lot more flexibility to take the students they want to take. And whatever those, whatever th that might be, that might be they want more students from a, a particular uh, geographic area. They might want more students who are interested in particular majors. They might want more first generation students, low income students, whatever it might be. It gives them now maximum flexibility to do that without having to worry about that test score. Yeah, so there's a financial component to this too, to test optional, which I think is just worth mentioning for those of you who are about to approach the process. So um, a generation ago when the class of 89 was applying, and I think most of the, the parents in this room um, you know, were applying not too long after that um, or a couple of years before, there was really just you know, one track for discounting. There was need-based financial aid. You'd hand over a bunch of personal data to the schools, and they would decide um, what they thought you could afford to pay, and then they would decide if they had enough money um, to sort of give you the discount that you needed. And it was sort of take it or leave it, and that was the system. Um, but you know, not long after we went through this sort of parallel track kind of split off from there that became known as merit aid. It was known as merit aid because a bunch of us schools in Ohio, they weren't the only ones, but this is where this really took hold, um, were essentially trying to like buy their way into a bit more status and a bit more selectivity by sending out application solicitations to you know, sophomores and juniors who had taken the PSAT who ended up with scores that were above average for their current undergraduate population. So they would go to these school, these students and these families and say, hey, you, know, you seem like a really great student, we'll waive your application fee, and if you end up coming here, we'll give you a special academic scholarship, right? And you know, Ohio Wesleyan starts doing that for a couple of years, and pretty soon, you know, Denison takes notice, and they've got a match, and College of Worcester does the same thing, and then all of a sudden, Case Western notices, and then pretty soon, Kenyon's got to do it, and by the time 10 years are up, up, you know, Oberlin's doing it too, right? So the whole state of Ohio, pretty soon this sweeps the nation. And at this point, all but, I don't know, let's call it the 40, you know, most selective schools in America are offering some form of discount to people who have the ability to pay. Right, so why would they do this? Well, it turns out at all but the most uh, selective institutions, um, there are a decreasing number of people 
um, who have the ability to pay, who also have the willingness to pay the full price, right? And again, the rack rate at private institutions has now crossed $80,000 per year, all in, and that's after taxes, right? Um, this is a lot of money, and people are only willing to pay so much, right? Um, Oberlin now gives everybody a $10,000 merit scholarship, right? This all happened very quickly from, you know, only the very best students getting it to like everybody getting a trophy. Um, so yeah, I mean, who would have thought that Oberlin would have offered participation trophies, but that's, ex <laughs> that's exactly what's happening now, right? Um, and so the question, you know, at schools who don't give these discounts out to everybody is how are they doing it? Well, it turns out behind the scenes, and Jeff wrote about this in his book and I wrote about it in mine, there's a whole world of consulting firms, like, you know, the McKinsey's of college admissions, right? And they've all got these sort of proprietary algorithms and they kind of show up behind the scenes at these admissions offices and, and enrollment management operations. And they say, okay, um, we're gonna help you figure out uh, exactly which kind of discounts to offer to what families, right? So they suck in all of this data about applicants' um, academic performance and the high school that they came from and their zip code plus four, which you know indicates uh, with a fair amount of precision how much income the family has, even if it didn't apply for financial aid, and how's the performance been from kids, you know, from other high schools and all of this other stuff and it sweeps it into a big computer program and then it suggests um, to the Office of Enrollment Management like how much of a discount to offer to an admitted student on the first pass, right? So as with every other industry, and this is definitely an industry, um, software is eating the world. Right now, lots of admissions offices do sort of, you know, hand-forged, semi-artisanal, you know, discount offering, um, <laughs> but Software, more often than you might think, um, makes the first pass and makes the first offer. So the question then becomes, if a school is missing what used to be a pretty important piece of data, right, SAT score or ACT score, um, how is it remaking these algorithms to decide what sort of discount to offer you? And if you're not sending a score to these schools that offer unpredictable discounts, what are they going to do with you? And could it cost you six thousand or eight thousand or fourteen thousand dollars a year? You know, if you don't have that, you know, thirty-three ACT score to send to the College of Worcester. Um, and it turns out that um, most schools, although not all, um, are not explaining this at all. Right. In fact, most of them don't explain how merit aid works. In fact. A lot of them would just as soon you not ask about it or not know about it at all, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of what I've been trying to solve for. Um, and the best advice I can give to you if the school isn't being crystal clear on their website about what they're doing and whether the test score or lack thereof will affect um, you know, what sort of merit aid your kid might or might not get is to just ask. Right? I think we need to um, sort of stop being um, uh, sort of supplicants in this process um, and have the courage to ask in a sort of level tone of voice exactly how things work. Nobody's going to hold it against you if you call school and say, hey, you know, my kid not, might not submit a test score. Um, is that going to change how you evaluate them for meriting? I just want to add one quick thing on that because I think it's really important, and, and this is where I love where Ron comes in terms of writing for people, is that this is, a, this is a purchase of a product. And I think that we tend to think of college as this kind of emotional coming of age moment. I think it was for most of us, right? It was, it was a time of, of great change in our lives. And I see this among parents, and I definitely see this among older generations when, you know, we wear, you know, sweatshirts advertising something that we bought 10, 20, 30, 40 <laughs> years ago. Like, where else does that happen in American so life true. where you actually purchase something at a very young age and you still advertise that product? a long time later because we have this emotional attachment to it. And as a result, I think that really um, impacts parents who are now, you know, Gen X parents now who are going through the college search process with their Gen Z kids, is that they still think of it as this emotional time in their own lives and they approach it with their kids in that way. But you are really, it is a business and you're buying a product 
And just like when you go and buy a car or you buy a house, um, like when you, I always tell people on the college tour, right, they only take you to a, a, a few buildings. Um, and I always ask parents, well, why didn't you go into this academic building where your kid is going to major in X and go see and sit in on a class or go see that professor? That's like going to do an open house on a house and not going to see the kitchen or not going to see all the rooms in the house. You would never do that. Right. But yet, for some reason, colleges and universities have trained parents and students to do that, to kind of just follow along. Look at any college tour, and they just are literally following, following along like sheep yeah. in many ways. And, and again, if, if you learn anything tonight, it's to take a lot more control over the process. And don't be embarrassed to ask these questions, um, because if you don't ask them, no one else will, and you're gonna feel at the end of the day that, not that you got taken, but that, you know, like, could I have gotten a better deal financially, or right. could I have maybe gone to a better place fit-wise, whether that's academic or, or social fit? Absolutely, and I think that one of the things that you both highlight so well is that not only is it a business in terms of the things you've stated, but it is a business in terms of the way the decisions are made. I think they have the ability to land in very different ways for families because many of our students have worked so hard, right? They have wonderful grades, they have wonderful testing whether they submit them or not. They're super involved, they're good people. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And so can you tell us both more about you know, how colleges are making these decisions in light of, again, their, their own institutional priorities and in similar veins? How does that impact that merit process? It's obviously veiled, but is there any sort of insight to what it is that they're looking for in terms of those decisions? I'll start with the admissions process and then we'll follow along with uh, financial aid. Um, admissions is not fair. Um, it never was fair, it never will be. Um, I think we all have different definitions of what merit means. If I went around this room and asked you, what do you think should matter in college admissions? If you're a good test taker, you're gonna say, well, test scores should be number one, right? If you have a good GPA, you're gonna say, well, GPA should be number one. If you participate in a lot of activities, you think activities should be number one. Um, so it is not a fair process. And I think that if you enter it, enter the process knowing that, um, and second, that you know that it is not about you, the student, but it is really around the institution and their institutional priorities, whatever those might be. Um, because again, they're getting, especially at these more selective places, they're getting so many more, so many quote unquote qualified applicants that they could build the same great class 10, 12 times over. So what they're trying to do is create a community based on what they think is important. And so it's important to realize that if you see a college that has a 25% acceptance rate, that doesn't mean you have a one in four shot of getting in. It means that if you bring to the table what they really need that particular year, um, you might have a 90% shot of getting in. But if you're like many other students that they don't, and they have an overabundance of them, you might have closer to a 0% shot of, of getting in. And so it's really important to understand that they all have these priorities, they're different per institution. Sometimes they differ by year. And what are those priorities? They may want more full pay students. They may want students from all 50 states. And they may want more students from the, you know, schools in the South might want more students from the Northeast, for example, or particular states. They might have new majors uh, in, in sciences or in healthcare that they need to, they want to fill. Uh, many institutions need men. Uh, particularly now. They may have a focus on first-generation students, low-income students, diversity of all kinds. So it's whatever th those priorities are multiple, um, or they might be narrow in some cases. So they might really focus on legacies. Uh, I talk a lot about athletics in, uh, in my book, right? Because most, almost every school, even at Division three, they have 22, 24 sports teams. They have to fill all those roster spots. Um, and so in many cases, they need somebody to, you know, be the pitcher on the baseball team or the forward on the soccer <clears> team, <throat> right? And so they need to fill those spots. So all of these priorities are coming into play. And so if we're in an auditorium, and this is all the seats in the freshman class of that college, you have all of these students competing for some of these seats, but some of these seats are just really reserved. They're really reserved for those athletes, or they're really reserved for this group, and you may have no access to those. 
And so that's what you're kind of competing against. And I guess the one last point that I didn't appreciate until I was in the process for a year is just how wide and deep these applicant pools are. Because you see your own high school, you might say, well, my kid is really talented in this high school. And maybe you have a little bit broader perspective because of your neighborhood and your friends, friends, and things like that. But remember that. We're just in one place here. Just replicate what is happening here. We have 25,000 high schools in the U.S. alone. 25,000 high schools. Emory, I think, gets you know, applications from eight or 9,000 high schools. So just imagine how deep and broad these pools are. And that is the competition. And I'm not telling you that to kind of depress you <laughs> about the process, but to really make you realistic consumers of the process. So then what happens when they get to the financial aid part? Sure. Well, I, I guess, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd start by telling you a little bit about how the consultants that work with the schools talk about the process when they know that there aren't families in the room listening and don't realize that there's someone listening who's there to represent the families. Um, you know, the way they talk about it is in terms of a sales funnel. So, you know, any of you who work in for-profit industries, um, you know, probably have had some exposure to this, but, you know, it's sort of pretty basic, right? Um, if you're trying to sell your product or service, you start with a, you know, extra large universe of your addressable market. Um, and, uh, you know, in the world of um, college-going people, that's, uh, what, like two million people a year or something like that, right? So, you know, you start with, like, the whole universe, right? Um, and then you try and sort of narrow it down realistically to, you know, who are the types of people demographically, geographically, who have been interested in your institution in the past, and then maybe some other groups that your institution may be institutionally prioritizing, right? Other people you'd like to have in the funnel, right? And then you try and figure out, okay, where is my, you know, sort of, how do I collect my um, prospects, right? And some of that is, you know, going around to schools and going to college fairs, but some of it is figuring out exactly how to buy the right names of the right 15 and 16 year olds from a handful of places that have the lists and, you know, sort of flinging messaging at them um, and then tracking very, very carefully, right? Who's opening the emails? Who's showing up at the website? These consulting firms are tracking all of this as best they can, and those tools get more sophisticated each year. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes that information is baked into the discount offer that you might eventually get if your kid applies, right? So if this is all sounding very corporate, um, it is, right? And this is not an indictment of the system or the people who, who work in it. Um, you know, one of the um, most incredible things about what we have here in the United States is that we have a lot of choice, right? Unlike in other parts of the country, you know, kids aren't sort of railroaded at a very young age into this track or the other track and, you know, the, never the track shall meet again and, and, you know, and then there's only seven universities you can go to at the end, realistically, right? We have a lot of choice. Um, and so, you know, all of these schools are trying to keep the lights on. Um, you know, there are fewer 18-year-olds than there used to be. Um, and so it's a real struggle to attract them. Now, you know, the thing that I might fault the schools for a little bit is that um, they're not always all that good at differentiating themselves, right? right. I mean, what really makes one place different from the other? Um, you know, the schools aren't so great at explaining how they make the music that only they can make. Um, but then again, <laughs> families aren't so great um, at figuring out what it is that they're shopping for in the first place, right? Um, so, uh, so, you know, it sort of starts there. And only at the end, um, you know, does the, does the price get quoted? Um, and I would just add that when the price gets quoted, um, that should only be the beginning of figuring out what you're going to pay. The schools have come to expect, um, the schools that offer merit aid in particular, but also the ones that do need-based aid only, have come to expect that 10, 20, 30, sometimes more percent of the people who get offers will come back and ask for a little more money. 
Um, so if this sounds familiar from the for-profit world, it should, right? This is how the auto industry works. This is how it works when you're buying um, other things with a six-figure price tag, like real estate, right? So it shouldn't come as any surprise um, that you know, people might ask for a reconsideration when it comes to college. Um, so you know, I could go on for minutes and minutes about exactly how to do that in a way that's not obnoxious, um, and you know, we can talk about it in the Q and A if we want. But you know, that too kind of resembles um, a business uh, in ways that really should not be surprising when you stop and think about it. But often people don't think about it that way or are too shy to interrogate the process because again, they feel like supplicants and not like applicants. Let's build on that a little bit, and in some ways, kind of tie what you're both saying. So first of all, Jeff, thank you for acknowledging the fact that the vast majority of schools in the country admit most of the students that apply. And so I'm highly aware that we are talking about selective colleges and universities. Uh, so I want to put that out there. Um, of course, Ron, I really appreciate that you, you mentioned there is a lot of choice. So there's actually nothing but good news, right, if we are willing to think about other institutions. So Ron, you do a really nice job in your book of articulating like what's worth paying for, what what should students be thinking about? And to your point, Jeff, about the fact that it is so hard to get into these highly selective schools. These, these students that are looking at schools really do need to, of course, I get it, you know, hope for the best in some of these highly selective pools, but really plan for the reality. So thinking about your point about what is worth paying for, how, what are those things? How can students expand to be thinking about the vast majority of, of opportunity that exists in higher education at the moment. Sure. Um, so when I ran laps around the country in you know, 2017, 2018, trying to get people to tell me what it was that they thought that they were shopping for when they were shopping for college, they would often look at me cross-eyed as if you know, the, the answer should be obvious. But then they wouldn't or couldn't exactly articulate it. And so I'd have to sort of pull it out of them. And eventually I started to hear the same three things over and over again, right? People were, um, wanted their kids to go to college for the learning, right? Um, you go to college to have your brain rearranged by an expert practitioner. Um, the second thing um, was that people were going to college for the kinship, right? You go to find your people right, the people who you may not have found in high school if you didn't go to Francis Parker. Um, <laughs> the people you could never have imagined existing in the world because the place that you came from didn't appreciate people like you. Um, and so that's what you're shopping for when you shop for college. And maybe those are peers, but maybe those are mentors, right? Maybe those are faculty members, maybe um, that's a, a a really good counseling department, maybe it's the um, you know, sort of campus chaplain, maybe it's a dean of students. I'm still in touch with the dean of financial aid uh, from Amherst, um, Joe Paul Case, or Saint Joe, as he's known <laughs> uh, in our household, right? Um, you know, nearly any grown up on a campus can make a difference in your life, and so that may be something that you're shopping for too, right? So you're shopping for the kinship, number three, um, you're shopping for the credential, right? And maybe that's the credential that allows you to sort of grab a middle class rung on the social class ladder and hang on for dear life in the way that your, your parents were not able to. Or maybe, right, maybe you're trying to sort of, you know, um, nudge a door open to a room that you and your upbringing and your parents and whatever privilege, if any, you're bringing to the table um, could not have given you access to without the credential that you're trying to acquire, right? So, you know, your kid wants to be an investment banker and somehow at the age of 17, all she wants to do is, you know, go be an analyst at Goldman Sachs when she's 22. Well, you know, she can go to the University of Wisconsin at Madison and that would be great. Um, and maybe that'll be $100,000 less than, um, you know, the Wharton undergraduate program at Penn. But the snobs at Goldman Sachs are hiring way few graduates from Madison than they are from Wharton undergrad. So even if you're not a snob, there's a whole bunch of snobs and elitists out there in the world who are gonna look at that credential and think something about your kid 
right? So are you willing to pay an extra $150,000 um, so that your 17-year-old daughter has a better shot at working herself to death um, at Goldman Sachs when she's 22? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I make no judgment about anybody who would, <laughs> but if you're not asking yourself that question, then you're probably not doing it right, right? So I don't know, I sort of think that's where, that's where the conversation starts. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's put some uh, numbers around it. So there are, uh, you know, according to the education department, something like 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. It's a huge number. 40% uh, of the sector is under 1,000 students. So we have a lot of tiny schools out there. So then you're thinking, well, like, how about these, you know, four-year residential colleges, you know, places maybe I've even heard of. Uh, you're still talking about a universe of about 1,200 colleges and universities, four-year colleges and universities, you know, residential uh, campuses. And then we, we've thrown this word selective out here uh, tonight. So selective normally means they accept fewer than 50% of students who apply. And we're talking about then a universe of about 200 colleges. So 1,200, 1,300 four-year residential colleges, 200 of them selective. Selective meaning less than 50%. Many of those selective colleges, by the way, even today, still accept 30, 40% of, of students. So when you read about, what, one of the things that frustrates me, when you read about how hard it is to get into college and you know, these acceptance rates in the single digits, we are really talking about a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 colleges maybe, right? We are not talking about the vast majority of colleges and universities. And then you might say, well, if they accept most of the students who apply, they don't rank in the top 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 of US News and World Report. How do we know they're any good? Um, and as, I, as we pointed out, right, like there are 2 million plus kids that, uh, that graduate from uh, high school every year. 75% of them go right on to college, right? So most of them are going to places that are not among those selective institutions. Four years later, maybe five, maybe six, they're graduating, they're getting jobs, and they're being productive members of society. Yes, maybe they're not working at Goldman Sachs. Maybe they're not a Supreme Court justice. Maybe they're not working at the New York Times. Um, but they're, they're, they're having great lives. And, um, and to me, that is what college at the end of the day is about, right? Does it give you that piece of paper that enables you to have that life after college that enable, enables you to be a productive member of society, to participate in a democracy, um, and to enjoy things in life. And, and my feeling is, after covering this for 25 years, you don't have to go to a highly selective college to do that. Um, there are people that fail out of Harvard every year. There are people that go to Harvard and don't get into those highest rungs of, of, of society. And so what I think you're looking for is a lot of the stuff that Ron talks about in his book, the mentors. The, the, cor you know, the, the courses where you're actually going to learn, uh, when you're, where you're going to learn something, places that you're actually going to be, want to go back to and, and, and graduate from, places that are going to give you real work experience. So there's all these things that you should be looking for in a college that don't necessarily correlate with their acceptance rate. Um, and that, I think, is, is a really important thing to remember, especially given that these acceptance rates at these highly selectives are tiny, they're minuscule. And so your chances of getting in are, are nil anyway, so you might as well look at this larger selection of institutions. Yeah, I'll just add one thing that I thought of listening to Jeff talk about this topic, which is that um, you know, everybody's gonna have their own way of doing this, and you should, and I, you know, I only thought about my own experience in retrospect after coming up with this framework, and I, you know, I learned a fair bit in college, but that, that was really, I, I learned a lot more here, uh, frankly, than I did at college. Um, and the credential has definitely been meaningful in my life. Um, but, you know, I'm a kinship guy at the end of the day. And, you know, if you're shopping for kinship, um, there are not a lot of great metrics. But we were talking earlier today about, um, the way in which, um, you know, and I, I find this to be true when I wander around doing this work all over the country, is that, you know, inevitably um, when I'm speaking, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, Ann Arbor or San Diego or Austin, Texas or Atlanta, Georgia, every single night 
there will be either somebody from Parker or somebody from Amherst in the crowd, right? So could I have measured that somehow ahead of time when I was making my choice? Probably not, right? But could I have asked, well, what percentage of your alumni show up for reunion? during reunion years, right? Have you attempted to measure the extent to which the alumni are connected on LinkedIn, you know, from any given class? Um, most schools, at least ones of, you know, reasonably large size or with at least a moderate amount of resources are trying to come up with some way, you know, to measure the interconnectedness of the alumni base. Um, and there's nothing wrong with asking them for that. You know, they usually don't make this stuff public, but um, you can ask. Uh, U.S. News once, and maybe it still does, you know, use this um, sort of... Uh, a percentage of alumni who give, right, as a metric. Um, Princeton inevitably, you know, shows up in the top five, and somebody once told me that Princeton has like 200 people working for their development office. Um, you know, if you hire enough people, you can, you know, get enough $5 donors, right? <laughs> but these, in all seriousness, these are the sorts of questions that you should ask, right? And if um, the only thing that you care about is, is the credential, then you should go to the career office and ask them how many people are working for Goldman Sachs? How many people did get hired for, you know, by Teach for America? Um, you know, of the you know, top 10 um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, liberal arts programs, um, uh, you, you know, sort of PhD programs or, or law school admissions or med school admissions in the United States, right? Where does your school rank, right? What, what did that credential mean to the top 25 law schools or the top 50 med schools? Um, these are things that you can ask for. And again, you know, no judgments if the only thing you care about is the learning or the only thing you care about is the kinship, but um, if you're going to pay a whole pile of money for that alone, then it sort of behooves you uh, to ask for any evidence that you can find before you lay down that much money for that thing. I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions because I know we're, we're getting close. Uh, I, I love that we're talking about kinship, and I think the one thing that I would add, particularly for parents here at Parker and certainly for our students, is that the one other thing that is very important in addition to the friendships, in addition to the kinship, is diverse perspectives. And so, of course, we all know that in the news, the hot topic is, of course, the impending Supreme Court decision uh, around affirmative action. So as you think about you know, the, the future, what, what do you think will happen? What do you think will change in the admissions world if race-conscious admissions is overturned? Well, um, <laughs> sorry, I know a really, really loaded question. No, uh, well, what do I think is going to happen? I mean, we are clearly from the Bakke decision, which was the first major affirmative action decision in, in higher education in the mid 70s. We have been moving toward less race conscious admissions um, since then, right? And it's clear, judging from the questions uh, on October 31st in these most recent cases uh, at the University of North Carolina and Harvard that we are likely moving to overturn uh, the use of race in admissions, which we'll know by, by June. So I think that every college and university, first of all, mostly impacting these more selective places, right, where there are way many more applicants than there are seats. Um, and, and race is used uh, in a way in admissions. I saw it when I uh, covered this, but, but I guess what was frustrating me in listening to the justices ask these questions, and it, by the way, it didn't matter which side of the issue they were on, this was coming from both sides in this, uh, in this discussion, is that they thought that race was really used up front in many ways, right? That, that there was a, a, a separate process, for example, for, uh, for, for black students or for Latino students, um, where, where in many cases, in most cases, at least at the three institutions that I was at, uh, it's used kind of at the very end of the process, right? Because in many ways, again, as I said earlier, all these, all these selective institutions could, could have, you know, 10, 10 12 times the, uh, the classes that they have if you just look at the academic metrics, right? So they have to make cuts somewhere. And so what's happening is that they have, you know, when, when they start reading applications, they have what is called a, a really a rough sense of what the class looks like, and then they put the finer points on it. Do we, again, do we have gender diversity? Do we have racial diversity? Do we have ethnic diversity? Do we have geographic diversity? And that's where they're pulling and pushing out kids 
at the very end. So they're pulling people out of the you know, deny bin and putting them in the admit bin, taking people from the admit bin and putting them in the deny bin. But when they're doing that, they're not suddenly taking an unqualified, quote unquote, unqualified kid from the deny bin and putting them in the admit bin. These are all very qualified students. And, and what they're doing is just kind of shaping them into, into the class. And so, so that's the, the first part, is that I think that we have a, a mistaken view, in my opinion, of what race conscious admissions even means, um, first. So second, I think we're moving away from that. It's clear where the Supreme Court's going, and I think that every institution now is trying to figure out how. How are we going to admit a diverse class uh, without using race as a, as a factor? And you know, in some states already have experiences with this, like California and Texas, Washington State, where I, where I was. And, and I think we're gonna, I think this is the big reason why um, testing is not coming back in a big way, because I think without a test score, without requiring a test score, it gives institutions a lot more flexibility in building a class. Because if you don't have a test score, when a plaintiff comes in and says, we're gonna sue you because you're using race in admissions, one of the things they do in discovery is they collect all that data on test scores and they say, ah, you accepted a black applicant with a lower test score than this white applicant you denied, ha ha. Right, well now if you don't have test scores for every single applicant, it gives institutions a lot more flexibility in that front. So I think one of the things that's definitely not gonna happen, is definitely gonna happen, assuming where the Supreme Court's going in June, is they are going to, um, I think, are going to stay test optional as a result. I would add just one thing to that, which is that you know, if things go the way uh, just about everybody expects them to go, um, the only um, preferences uh, in admissions that will remain are um, legacy preferences in most instances, um, athlete preferences in just about all instances, right. and um, so-called development cases for you know, people with 10-figure net worths um, and above who are potentially seven-figure donors. Um, so uh, legacy preference, um, majority white, majority rich. Uh, development preference, majority white, majority super, super rich. Athletic preference, majority white, majority rich in just about all of the sports. Um, so if that's all that's left in terms of who gets an edge, that's not gonna be a real good look. That's not what equity looks like. So what's gonna be the easiest thing to get rid of at that point? None of those things are gonna be particularly <laughs> easy to get rid of, um, but I think we'll see legacy preference go away at a lot more um, schools with large endowments than we will see football teams go away. Thank you, thank you for you know, your thoughts on that. I, we can't talk about the college admissions process without talking about the inequities. We didn't even scratch the surface, but I'm so grateful that we did get to address part of that. I also think that quite frankly, questions around identity that are very popular among a lot of supplemental college-specific questions will be on the rise. You know, Jeff, you mentioned that Tim Fields is, is here in the crowd. You know, he, he co-authored a book that was just released called The Black Family's Guide to College Admissions, a conversation about education, parenting, and race. And I think that those questions around identity that are, are, are going to just continue to increase. So I'll, I'll, I'll save you know, our conversation around that perhaps for Q&A if folks are interested. But I guess if I had to just ask just quickly, because I know that we're kind of at time, I'd love to, you know, we've had a fabulous conversation. I've learned so much from both of you. Thank you so much. You've given the room tons of food for thought. I'm curious to end with just your, your final thoughts, I suppose, on where do you think higher education is gonna be in five to 10 years? And what gives you hope amidst the changes on, on the horizon in college admissions? Uh, I'm gonna take the liberty of, um, answering the uh, equity question that you didn't ask. Um, I think Thank Jeff's you. better on the future than I am anyway. <laughs> um, so I have a chapter in my book about shopping for diversity, um, which I think is important. And I, I think, you know, ranks up high in the list of important factors for the majority of families and hopefully the vast majority of the families, at least that I'm trying to reach. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in socioeconomic diversity just because I was on need-based financial aid myself. And one of the things that's disturbing about um, the ways in which um, less selective institutions um, try to, in effect, buy their way uh, you know, into higher status is that they do it by chasing more affluent students. Um, just because of the nature of the way this has tended to work and all sorts of issues of inequity that go back decades, um, you know, wealthier families um, and often white families, um, you know, the kids from those families, those school districts, those schools, um, you know, will often have um, higher SAT scores, higher grades. Uh, those numbers get fed into the U.S. news list, and you know, schools want more of those students, such as. Um, uh, you know, so as to, you know, further rise up the U.S. news ranking, right? And so when they go out and spend decades the way that um, Northeastern and USC and Tulane um, did, uh, you know, very successfully, like, buy their way up the U.S. news list, often using merit aid, um, they tend to end up with a richer population of students. Um, so just in the last couple of years, the federal data has gotten granular enough um, that we're now able to see which, you universities, and they're always private ones, um, have the lowest percentage of Pell Grant students in the nation, Pell Grant being the federal grant that goes to the lowest income students from the lowest income families. Um, and um, Tulane, in fact, was, very, was the very last school in the country uh, a year ago when the data came out. Um, a new round of data just came out, um, and I, I wrote a column about it in the Times a week or two ago. Uh, Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut, is now on the bottom. Um, Fair, Fairfield used to be 15% Pell, now 7.5% Pell. Um, you don't go down that quickly over a period of six or seven years unless you're doing it on purpose. Right? So if you don't want your kids to go to an institution um, that is mostly for affluent kids, and uh, my guess is that you know, most of us, uh, if not all of us, want more socioeconomic diversity uh, in the same way that many or most or all of us want more um, racial and gender and other types of diversity, you can now shop that data as well. And if you don't like the fact that some schools, including a whole bunch that you've heard of, um, have um, such a low percentage of low-income families, you can say so, right? You can ask about this. You can vote with your feet. So just two quick thoughts uh, so we could get to uh, two questions. One is, um, I'll answer the future in a second, is we talked a lot about what, what doesn't matter in admissions or the, uh, uh, the options that colleges are looking at in terms of their priorities. We didn't really talk about, well, what gets you in? right? Because um, we talked about test optional being one of them. But, you know, even before the pandemic, so I, I reported my book in 2018 and 2019, and then all these colleges went test optional, and I'll never forget the editor at my publisher said, oh my God, what are we going to do with this book now? Because, you know, you went test optional. And I said, well, testing really wasn't a big piece even before the pandemic. So even all these colleges and universities, including Emory, um, which was required testing when I was there uh, in 2018, 2019, it was always a kind of a, as I called it, a check-in, right? The, if they didn't, if there was something on the transcript, the high school transcript, that didn't quite make sense, uh, or maybe they didn't know the high school well enough, they would look at, that's when the, the test score would kind of come into play a little bit. But the most important thing in college admissions is the high school record, right? Is the, is the courses you take in high school and the grades you get. Because that is really, you know, four, as they, they say, and now the SAT is going to be a shorter test, but, you know, four years of, of high school is much more important than a couple of hours on a, on a test. And, and the courses that you decide to take and how much you challenge yourself and the grades that you get in those courses really, and we know this from research, not only matter to how you start college, but also how you finish college and, and whether you graduate. And that's what admissions offices are looking. That's the first thing they look at when they open up the application, it's the thing they spend the most time on is really analyzing that high school transcript and the grades that you get in that high school. And that's, by the way, something that you have control over, right? There's a lot of parts of this process you don't have a lot of control over. You can't control who's gonna read your application on what day, what kind of mood they're gonna be in. You can't control who else is in the applicant pool. But you can control the courses you decide to take 
and the grades that you, um, you get in those courses for the most part. And so that's the most important thing as you're thinking about what do I want to focus on in high school. It doesn't mean ignore the extracurricular activities. It doesn't mean ignore the essays and things like that. But it does mean that that's what is the most important thing in, in, terms, of, in terms of getting in. And then just one last point on, on the future. You know, we're headed to a, a period right now, by the way, where um, we're going to see a huge decline in the number of high school graduates in the, in the U.S. So in 2025 in the U.S., we're going to have the, the largest high school graduating class for quite some time in the United States. And then in the latter part of this decade, just when my kids graduate from high school, <laughs> perfectly timed, uh, we are gonna see a downturn because we had our kids during the Great Recession. Um, and there weren't a lot of kids born during the Great Recession. And then there weren't a lot of kids born after that. And then we're gonna hit the pandemic uh, classes after that. What, what is that gonna mean? The stuff that Ron described tonight, the aggressiveness around financial aid, is only gonna get more aggressive, right? Because we're now gonna have to fill seats with students that the only way we're gonna get them is to steal them from another college. Um, and so we're gonna, we may see some colleges go out of business, we're gonna see some colleges get smaller, but more than anything, we're gonna see colleges get very aggressive in terms of those discounts. Um, and we're already starting to see that. We're starting to see bigger discounts than we've ever seen before. But this, this next period, starting in around 2025, um, if you have kids at the latter part of this decade, um, you know, the discounts that you're, gonna, you're reading about in Ron's work, I think are just going to get bigger and, and bigger.